swingers on the screen. Uh, you know what that's over here. All right. Wonderful. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Davey Smith, my pronouns are Davey Smith. I'm one of our speakers for speaker today. So, Colin, tell us a little bit about where you're from. Okay. Um, so, I was uh, born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, and I still and so I spent, you know, most of the beginning of my life to uh, focus on skiing and mountain biking and also get a PhD. And so um, after that, you know, I moved a little bit west and then I, um, for my postdoc actually, you know, uh, so I was at the University of Utah and I did my uh, PhD with Les Sundquist looking at the protein network involved in HIV budding um, and sort of structure function relationships. And then Went to do my postdoc at Caltech a little bit further west, and then I also picked up uh, surfing in addition to mountain biking and skiing, as far as my how I spend my free time. And then there, I really took a step back from structure function and started using animal models to look at uh, specific aspects of um, HIV dissemination and pathogenesis in um, tissues. And so, so that I've sort of uh, transitioned recently uh, to the University of Illinois as an assistant professor in the department of microbiology, where I'm continuing a lot of that work, and I'll tell you also about some additional work we're developing in the pipeline. Okay, that's good. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, Davey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my talk is titled Visualizing the Interface of HIV and Immune System with 3D Multiscale Tissue Imaging. Uh, and so, Really, it's been a, a great meeting so far, and uh, I did my postdoc north of here a little bit at Caltech, and so it's great to be back in the general Southern California area. And it's also been great to meet with uh, you know, a bunch of you and really hear about the uh, amazing work that's going on here. And um, when I say thank you, I really mean thank you, because when I left uh, Illinois, you can see the temperature was actually seven out when I woke up. Um, and this is what my backyard looked like. So it's truly great to be here in San Diego right now. Um, so with that, let's move on to the science a little bit. And so brief outline, uh, some of you have seen, you know, a chunk of this talk, but I put some um, additional new work in here. But I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, um, establishment of a multi-scale imaging method to study HIV transmission uh, in humanized mice, where we've done most of our methods of development. And then I'm going to tell you a, a, a story that I think is pretty cool. It's also exciting that it's um, recently published about a week ago, and that's identification of mechanisms uh, that macrophages uh, can enhance HIV dissemination uh, in the bone marrow. And so finally, then I'm going to move forward into the collaboration that we're establishing here uh, at UCSB, looking at um, imaging HIV-infected human patient samples um, in, in order to understand um, you know, HIV pathogenesis in the real, you know, thing, not in the model. So with that, um, I always uh, put this slide up here where, you know, none of us here, um, you know, uh, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, sort of HIV and the problem, um, sort of worldwide problem. I'm not going to go too much into the background other than to say that, you know, uh, electron microscopy and imaging was critical in, um, establishing HIV as a causative agent of AIDS uh, over 35 years ago. And I think as you see in the talk, we're still actively using uh, electron microscopy along with other methods of imaging to go and really understand, you know, what's going on in tissues. Because uh, as we all know, that's where all the action happens. And so my lab's really been interested in Studying how the early stages of HIV infection progress at the level of individual cells and virions uh, in lymphoid tissues. And we're really interested in, you know, sort of all aspects of transmission from the initial, um, you know, transmission event across an epithelial cell layer to localized dissemination uh, in the genital tract or other tissues. And then this establishment of latent reservoir within one to two days uh, after infection. Uh, and then you know, from there, after establishment of the uh, latent reservoir in uh, the lymphatics, then there's this systemic spread, um, you know, more or less all lymphoid tissues and other tissues, including the um, 
central nervous system. And so um, today we're largely focusing on this uh, systemic spread, which happens um, you know, over the course of about seven to 21 days in most infected individuals. But also, you know, we're also interested in looking at uh, virus rebound, and we've had some uh, after cessation of antiretroviral therapy, and so we've had some recent collaborations uh, looking at that as well in animal models. And so, importantly, you know, we've been studying this for nearly 40 years, but, you know, details of virus spread at the single cell and cellular resolution is just really pretty lacking. We still, you know, this is where most of the action happens. We don't really understand what's going on um, at the uh, tissue level um, in great detail. Mm. And so, when I think about imaging in tissues, I think of a, a continuum where we have sort of large volume, low resolution images, and this can extend all the way up to very high resolution methods that have very small volumes. And you know, this is really important because the scale at which you look at things tells you different um, uh, things about the system and what you're looking at and the sort of context with which you can place the information that you're extracting uh, from a sample. So these scales can translate to things such as when I think of low resolution, I think um, but at large volume, I think of whole animal, meaning small whole animal, um, or entire organs down to the single cell level and even down to subcellular levels. And some of the example methods that we've used are bioluminescence, we're looking at entire uh, animals or entire organs, and then we can use uh, light microscopy to see individual HIV infected cells within intact tissues. And then we can go even further and actually go to see individual viruses um, within their native tissue sites. And, you know, uh, overall, this integrated multi scale imaging approach is really providing insights into pathogenesis. And so my lab's been uh, largely involved in. Uh, animal models of disease, where we're using animal models to really establish the methods um, and, you know, really convince ourselves of what we're seeing. And these have been um, using HIV as a model system. We've also started looking at bacterial pathogens in animal models, as well as uh, cancer. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in is the intersection between um, various uh, pathogens, whether it be, um, you know, human tumor cells or HIV or uh, something like Staph aureus and also the intersection with the immune system and you know how these uh, sort of two things happen during pathogenesis. And so my lab's long-term vision is to directly correlate global pathology with structural details that occur during disease. And we want to do this in order to determine mechanisms of pathogenesis and also um, understand treatments and how uh, the models and the uh, will respond to various treatments and sort of see if we can improve this and also uh, understand the efficacy better. And so I just talked about this. Uh, these are some of the uh, workflows we've been using so far, but some of the specific techniques are, um, or I might add that, you know, there's always, you know, the ultimate idea is to gain insights into the me mechanistic details of pathogenesis and also treatment. So if we think about this, you know, we've both done this locally, we've had humanized mice, we've also collaborated, and we've also um, gone into non-human primate studies through collaborations um, with various primate centers. Um, and then the sort of modalities, I talked about bioluminescence on the previous uh, slide, but then we're also using um, we have some early uh, um, preliminary studies looking at um, pet imaging of um, SIV-infected monkeys, um, and then uh, then we, what we can do is we can use this in alive animals to actually tell us, you know, when and where to look for things. And that's really the critical aspect because if you uh, think about this, this um, mouse here, there's really, there's foci of infection here in the spleen and here in the gut um, and then also in the lymph nodes up top. Um, but there's also, you know, a lot of areas where there's not infection going on. And so this can sort of really guide us and um, in a very um, smart way where to look. Uh, as opposed to just scanning everything. And then we've been using tissue clearing and confocal and light sheet microscopy to gain single cell resolution in volumes. And then finally, we can use three-dimensional EM methods such as electron tomography or serial block-based EM to gain more ultra-structural information about these tissues. And um, the other thing that we've been working on in the lab is methods development. And so some of these items involve 
large volume in situ hybridization of clarified tissue samples. Um, this can also be um, formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples as well. And then finally, we're starting to develop some super resolution uh, tissue imaging modalities with the sort of ultimate goal of going from big to small within one tissue and knowing what you're looking at both globally and locally uh, at all volumes and resolutions. And so this maybe gets uh, to the point most, uh, uh, you know, why I'm, I'm here to be talking with you is that what we really want to do is establish you know, our, our modalities in, in um, animal models with the idea of going to more translational samples and understanding what's actually going in, uh, going on in human patients. And that's uh, something that we're really excited about and uh, moving forward very rapidly with. And so I'll just really briefly tell you about our uh, humanized mouse models where we can generally just take uh, human immune cells and um, inject them into an immunodeficient mouse and then over the course of weeks to months, these animals will reconstitute a human immune system uh, to varying levels, depending on what you, um, which model you use. But um, they generate, um, reconstitute a human immune system in the spleen, spleen the gut associated lymphoid tissue, uh, the reproductive tract, bone marrow, uh, you name it. And there's various aspects of HIV pathology that we can really uh, query and interrogate uh, using these animals, things such as uh, you know, um, systemic spread occurs, there's latency models in uh, animal models. And so, you know, depending on the question that we're asking, uh, we can really use these models to inform us about uh, what might be going on in human patients. And so, so the, the main platform I'm going to talk about today is this, um, you know, combining both light microscopy microscopy to look at HIV transmission. And so what we can do is we can take these humanized mice and infect them with HIV. Um, for today's work, this was done in collaboration with Dong Sung An at UCLA. And so what we can do is we can actually make entire organs, this here is a mouse spleen, and we can make them optically transparent, so completely see-through. Um, and then we can use various uh, modes of light microscopy to generate uh, images that are cubic millimeters to cubic centimeters in volume, but with single cell resolution. And in parallel, we can use uh, higher resolution methods like, and we can combine sample preparation that uses high pressure freezing and freeze substitution fixation uh, in combination with electron tomography to generate images that are, you know, low volume, tens of cubic microns, but with single virus resolution. And so what this really allows us to do is, um, you know, gain insight into the bio biological mechanisms of HIV dissemination in tissues. And, Really, what we want to do is correlate what's going on globally and locally, as I said earlier, uh, looking at the global pathology and the structural details that are occurring. And so um, we use tissue clearing, and so there's a, a, a huge number of tissue clearing um, methods. And this has come into vogue recently. It's, it's kind of interesting. Tissue clearing was actually initially um, sort of developed in the late 1800s, um, and actually so was uh, light sheet microscopy as well, you know, sort of late 1800s to um, early 1900s, and it sort of, you know, fell out of favor uh, for other methods that now with the advent of um, modern, you know, computing technologies and, and you know, advanced microscopy methods, um, you know, people have uh, readdressed this, and it's really, um, you know, especially in the um, neurobiology field is really changing um, the question that can be asked and actually allow mapping of the you know, entire nervous system. But, you know, we can also use this technology to look at um, pathogenesis models and see what's going on, not just in the nervous system. And so the basic principle of tissue clearing is that we can use um, various, um, you know, sort of chemical cocktails, they can be uh, organic solvents, they can be detergents, things like that. We more or less extract, after we have a fixed sample, we can more or less extract, um, you know, most of the molecules that um, prevent light from penetrating into a sample or cause light to be absorbed or diffracted through a sample. And so in doing so, you can see here um, on the right, you can take an entire, and this is a work from the UADA lab, and these um, protocols are really pioneered by the labs, uh, the UEDA lab, the Granaro lab, and the Bisarov lab, but you can actually make an entire animal um, transparent. This is really kind of crazy if you, if you think about it, but then we can also conduct standard immunostaining and um, molecular labeling techniques, and we can show 
that we can actually find, um, you know, image large regions of tissue and then go and zoom in to higher and higher levels of magnification to really understand uh, the general structure of what's going on in a tissue. And so, you know, a lot of this has been done um, at the whole animal level or at the uh, entire um, brain uh, organ level. And so what uh, we did at the, um, what I did at the beginning of my postdoc was we were able to actually take um, HIV infected animals and um, we can clear the tissues from these HIV infected animals. We can immunostain them and we can image them. And so what you can see here is that we can you know, take lymphoid organs uh, such as the, uh, the colon or the reproductive tract or the spleen and we can make them optically transparent. And then we can go and look at these samples and after molecular labeling and we can look and see uh, specific cell types that are present in the tissue. For example, here in green, at, uh, um, around the base of a crypt, you can see an intestinal crypt, you can see uh, HIV target cells in green, and you can see, um, sorry, there are uh, HIV positive cells in green and potentially HIV target cells in magenta. And we can do this for a whole host of uh, tissues. Uh, basically, any tissue that we've looked at so far, including uh, lymph nodes, thymus, brain, and bone marrow, we've been able to use these methodologies. So they're highly translatable, and I think that's something that's really important. And we've also, as so you'll see, we've done this in non-human primate samples, as well as we began to do this in human patient samples. So it's uh, really nice when a technique works um, uh, with a broad variety of sample types. And so I think, you know, those previous images that we saw looked a lot more like the classic sort of immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence images that you're, that you're used to seeing. But we can um, use um, these methodologies to do conduct three-dimensional imaging. So what you can see here in this image is that um, what was spinning around there was uh, the base of the villus, uh, the villi of the intestine, and they're extending up towards the top of the screen. And then what we can look at is the... Um, the distribution of various cell types, and we call this biodistribution. And then we can, you know, we can quantify this, and we can look at the distances, the densities, the locations of specific cell types. Is there polarization of infection? Does it change over time? We can uh, query all of these things. Um, and so, if we look at this sample uh, again, what you can see here is that uh, we found HIV target cells in magenta are more localized to the bottom third of the villi and into the crypt regions whereas uh, CD8-positive T-cells are more ubiquitously <coughs> distributed throughout the whole volume, and the HIV-infected cells are also localizing where the target cells are, which is not that surprising, but the distributions were also, were also quite similar to what we find in um, human patient samples that have been published, and also um, we found that over time these distributions did not change. So this is just to give you a feel of the sort of um, types of data that we can generate uh, by tissue clearing and light microscopy uh, of these samples. And so that was all confocal microscopy, but you know, what we've been really pushing on is to uh, generate larger volume images so we can look at you know, more cubic millimeter to cubic centimeter volumes. And so light sheet microscopy um, requires using a cylindrical lens to take your standard laser and turn it into a very thin plane of light about 400 nanometers in width. And so what we can do is we can illuminate a 400 nanometer region of an entire sample um, that's pretty large. And then the light goes off in a perpendicular and then we can use uh, uh, high powered CMOS or CCD cameras uh, to very rapidly acquire images. And so some of the, over here, are some of the um, you know, things that make light uh, sheet microscopy very <coughs> useful for us. Um, but one of the important things are high volume and uh, extremely rapid imaging is something that's very beneficial for us. And so practically speaking, what this looks like is that we can take a sample. Here you can see a cleared sample and we can place it, immerse it in the middle of the light sheet with a, um, in a cuvette with, that contains um, a liquid that's refractively indexed matched to the actual sample that has been cleared. And then we can go and we can image the sample. So, this example here on the right, you can see that as I'll um, pan through it there, and this gives you an idea of what the raw data looks like, but here the villi are sticking out into the, um, onto the right side of the image and potential HIV target cells are in magenta and HIV positive cells are in green. 
And so if we look at this and we pan through, you can see villi coming and going as they're panning through the entire sample. You see the occasional uh, spot where there's an infected cell popping up here. And so what this really allows us to do is look at a big volume. This is a you know a, um, equivalent volume to the one I showed you in the previous slide, but it uh, took about five minutes to acquire as opposed to uh, five hours to acquire. So it really speeds up our throughput. Um, and so this is to give you a, a little better uh, idea. Um, this is a so this would be from an HIV infected humanized mouse. So now this would be nearly the entirety of the um, intestine uh, in a, you know, sort of about a one millimeter width. And so what you can see here, this is a Z projection. So all of the uh, results are um, sort of pancaked on top of one another. But what we can see here is that you can see the villi all sticking up into the, um, the lumen of the intestine here. And you see these occasional little spots here where we have um, P24 positive or HIV infected cells. But you can also see there's a lot of spots where there, we see absolutely no infection. So what this really allows us to do is conduct a lot of scanning, you know, and, and see where to look. And so then we can go and we can find where our regions of interest are, and then we can go back and use um, other forms of light microscopy to, you know, see in finer detail what's going on. But to zoom in on one of these, you know, we can actually make out um, foci of infected cells here, here, here in yellow. And we can also make out other infected cells um, nearby. And so this sort of this um, idea of seeing foci popping up of infected cells, you know, in, you know, in reasonable distances from one another is a pretty regular uh, phenomenon that we see uh, using these methods as opposed to just seeing a wave of infection going through an entire uh, tissue. And so this is just a 3D model of that. So we can you know, start to make an entire 3D model of, a, you know, let's say this is about a half millimeter by two millimeters by two millimeters. And we can start to uh, tile these together where you can start to, you know, move your, um, you know, scope of imaging to several millimeters to several centimeters <laughs> along a single sample. So that was the um, sort of the big picture, you know, the sort of uh, global view. And now, you know, what's happening happening at the street view? And so this is where we use electron tomography. So we use the light microscopy to scan and see who to look for and what do we want to look for and where to look for it. And then we can go in with higher resolution methods to figure out what's going on uh, in structural detail. And so electron tomography is a bit like uh, a PET scan where you rotate all the way around um, a sample with an x-ray source and then um, you combine the axial images and you reproject them and it basically allows you to cre create a model that you can look at in all directions. And so electron tomography is pretty similar except instead we take the sample and we take images and then we rotate the sample and we do a lot of rotations in one direction and then the other and so that gives us a lot of information uh, and then what we can do is we can take all of these and only some all of these, we gain back the uh, original density of the object that's contained within these slices of um, plastic that contain samples that are stained for electron microscopy. Uh, and also the other great thing that we get 3D information, it also enhances our resolution uh, quite a bit. And so this is an example right here on the left of uh, HIV virions. Um, and so this is, you know, sort of what you might see if you're um, looking at a single tomographic slice um, and you can see individual viruses in the intracell uh, intracellular space, space between two cells. Um, here would be one cell, you can see the plasma membrane, and you can see that, you know, in tissue, things are just really convoluted and packed together. Um, and, you know, there's, there's philopodia all over the place, and it's just really complex as opposed to when you look at things in a dish. Um, but, you know, the other thing that we can do, which is really cool, and this to give you an idea of, um, you know, sort of the resolution, the questions we can address here, you can see the canonical cone-shaped core, of a mature HIV virion, and we can distinguish that from the spherical capsid of an immature virion. And we've also done immuno-EM to show that these are indeed HIV virions. Um, 
you know, as opposed to a mouse colony that is infected with MLB or something like that. And so this is really important. And then, you know, the, the real power of electron tomography is that we can gain three-dimensional information. So if we look at this, now you can see if we model this in uh, all dimensions, uh, what we have is actually not one single uh, pool of virus, but three distinct <coughs> pools of virus that are in different planes within the sample. And we can even make out budding virions from the end of a filopodia of the cell. And so, you know, you know, we very regularly see in mouse models hundreds to thousands of viruses that are packed between cells, um, you know, sort of free viruses all over. Um, and so, you know, what this really tells us is that we can spatially localize individual virions and infected cells within tissues, meaning that an infected cell, we know it's infected if it um, has a budding virus um, that's being produced from it. And so I'll just give you uh, one last example of this. So this is an image. Um, so this would be sort of your classic EM overview image using TEM without tomography. And this is spleen um, and various aspects of uh, the mouth, humanized mouse spleen are uh, recreated. Um, and so what we can do is we can zoom in on some specific areas. And so we look at this, this tissue that you know, morphologically resembles a um, lymphocyte. Uh, what we can see here is that we can make out, um, you know, these are, these are really cool. And as we look at the movie of the plays, it was having a little bit of uh, trouble earlier. We can see collagen. So this cell is completely um, surrounded by collagen here, uh, all around here. And then we have all these spots that, you know, kind of look kind of interesting and, you know, different. And what we can do is we can conduct tomography and start to look at this in greater uh, detail. And then, so what we can actually make out is that we can make out individual viruses um, that are being produced by this cell. And you can even see um, over here, it's a, my cursor's not working that well, but over in this uh, pocket down here, there's a few viruses that are actually in the process of being uh, released from the cell. Um, and so let's see if, if this actually ends up playing here. But um, we might just get a couple bits and pieces of this. But yeah, it's, uh, it's chugging through this. But as, this should be very smooth, but we can, I can show everyone later. Um, but as we go through this, we can actually make out um, you know, different um, layers of this, and we can actually model all of these viruses. And so in magenta are the viruses that are budding, in blue are the immature virions, and in green are the virions that have, uh, are mature and uh, potentially readily infectious at this point. And so this is just going through the, you know, a little bit more detail of the modeling that we can do. But um, if we go forward, in summary, what we can see is that, um, you know, we can actually quantify, this is sort of all of the viruses that we saw uh, modeled onto a single slice. And so if we look at this, what you can see here is that, um, you know, there's nearly a thousand viruses surrounding this one portion of the cell. And so we can extrapolate this out and, you know, say that there's, you know, upwards of five to 10,000 virions surrounding the cell in its entire volume. And we've even found examples where there's probably 10 to 20,000 viruses. So, you know, this starts to give us an insight into burst size. And, um, and then I think this also shows that this is really a, can be a very rapid production and release of virus from an infected cell. So that was sort of the, the summary of part one. And so, well, um, that's the summary of part one. And so, um, you know, we developed this uh, multi-scale imaging platform uh, using light sheet microscopy and um, electron microscopy. And so we were able to conduct uh, imaging by light microscopy of cubic millimeters to cubic centimeters um, with single cell resolution and also generate quantifiable data. And then uh, electron tomography also allowed us to generate higher resolution 3D information um, and really gives us insights into um, you know, mechanisms of virus release and where they're localized uh, within tissues. And I want to add this here that, you know, these methodologies are really translatable um, to all tissue types. And so that's um, moving forward what we're really interested in looking at. Um, so I'll briefly tell you a little, about, little bit about this um, story that was just published in eLife uh, last week. And so bone marrow um, is, you know, a, a target for HIV. As we all know, there's a lot of different um, immune cell types in bone marrow. And um, 
you know, that is the primary set of hematopoiesis in the body, and you know, basically, a, you know, a huge number of different bone marrow immune cell types are present. And importantly, there's a lot of um, cells in the bone marrow that are permissive to HIV. And so, if we uh, look at this here, as the computer gets up to speed, um, so there, yeah, there's, so there's um, you know, T cells, macrophages, there's uh, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, megakaryocytes, there's a ton of different cell types that could be infected. Um, and so here we are. And, you know, importantly, and I just want to, you know, this is why the, the bone marrow was of interest uh, for us to look at, um, is that it's, it has been shown to be detectable. Um, HIV infection has been detectable in bone marrow just weeks after infection. It can lead long term to bone marrow abnormalities and um, defects in hematopoiesis. Um, many immune cells in the bone marrow ultimately migrate to other locations in the body, um, <coughs> which could be a, a mode for um, HIV to systemically disseminate throughout the body. And then finally, um, it's been proposed to act as a reservoir or a sanctuary, but you know it's just simply not well characterized in vivo. So with that in mind, uh, we wanted to ask when and where is HIV found within the bone marrow, and what are the mechanisms of HIV dissemination in the bone marrow? And, we can do this for the bone marrow, but I think, you know, it's also good to keep in mind, we can do this with, you know, just about any tissue as well and ask these same questions. So what we use is this um, protocol called the Bone Clarity Protocol, and this was developed by Viviana Andrade-Naro at Caltech. What you can see here is that on the top, we have an entire mouse leg um, that's fixed, and then you can see on the bottom here, it's then made optically transparent. And so then we can go and we can image that entire um, or a portion of that leg and generate a 3D register of what um, the, the sample looks like. So you can see here, we can model where the bone is and we can, um, and we do this so that we have an understanding of where everything um, that we're looking at is. And then we can go in and find our resolution, conduct immunostaining, image that, and then um, basically create a model of what was previously inside the, the um, bone marrow uh, you know, within the animal. So if we look here, now this is what our raw data looks like with a light sheet microscope. So you can see as we're panning through in the Z direction, you know, this gives you the information like you would see um, numbers wise from a flow cytometry plot. But if we model it in 3D, we also gain um, information in a three dimensional format. So and here you can see in um, red or macrophages in magenta here are uh, <coughs> uh, CD4 positive T cells. Um, and then we have our HIV infected cells in, in a few places. And so now that's a lot of information. It's cool. But then we can quantify this as well. And this is important. So we can actually use uh, segmentation algorithms to quantify this and actually pretty rapidly get an idea of, you know, the number and the distribution of the different cell types that are present in these tissues over time. And so this um, is a summary of uh, some of the data that we generated, but, you know, what we found is that the, you know, the T cell density dropped over the course of the infection in magenta, whereas the macrophage uh, density stayed relatively constant uh, over time. And then finally, at all times, we were able to detect um, small but appreciable levels of HIV infected cells in green in these samples. And so, um, but, you know, when we actually looked at who was infected with HIV, that's where we saw something that was quite interesting. And what we actually found that in red here um, is that at all time points uh, from, you know, early on, 10 days after infection up to about, you know, three months uh, post-infection, macrophages made up the greatest proportion of HIV infected cells in the tissue. And that was really not uh, very expected by us. And so um, one of the take home messages is that macrophages um, were the primary cell type associated with in bone marrow with um, from these HIV infected humanized mice. And so that um, and then so then what we did is, you know, what we can do is we know that macrophages were the cells that were most likely infected in this tissue. Now, let's go and look at macrophages um, by higher resolution methods and see what we can find. And so right here, what you can see is that um, this is just to show an overview of a vascularized region of bone marrow. And you, know, you can really, really see the, um, 
the diversity of cell types that are present here. Um, and then one other thing that's, uh, and this is just down here, if we zoom in, you can see an example of a cell that's actually producing virus in direct contact you know, with a potential target cell. So once again, this is just an example of seeing what looks like direct cell-to-cell uh, -cell transmission of um, HIV within an actual tissue. And so macrophages are larger, they have uh, than T cells, they have a convoluted morphology and multi-load nuclei. And so what you can see here, we have this um, you know, huge macrophage and you can see in white all these uh, invaginations within the macrophage. And then here we have a you know, T cell that's basically a nucleus with so just a tiny bit of cytoplasm. Um, and you can see that there's a cytocontact between these two cells. Um, but if we look at this in a little greater detail, um, what you can see is that that cell down there is actually producing an HIV virion. Um, and so, but you know, if we look, so that's great. Macrophages are doing, you know, they're professional eaters. They're going and they're trying to find, um, you know, and process potentially um, pathogen uh, infected uh, cells. And so, you know, they're always on the lookout for pathogens. But if we look inside the cell already, what you can see is that by electron tomography, we're actually able to find um, many, many viruses within um, the center of the cell. And so um, we found virions budding in magenta into enclosed compartments. We found immature virions within enclosed compartments in yellow. We found mature virions in green that were in enclosed compartments. And then we also in blue saw mature virions that were contained within surface impaginations. And so this is just a model, all of these in 3D. And then if we extrapolate this to the entire volume of the cell, we found, we quantify that there are greater than 11,000 virions that are contained within the cell. So, you know, this really is, you know, a, a potential reservoir or dissemination, you know, um, vehicle, if you will, um, in this example. Um, and then finally, you know, we wanted to make certain that these were actually um, it completely enclosed. So you can see the, the membrane goes away and then goes away completely. So these are truly uh, membrane enclosed uh, vesicles. And this is something that's, uh, you know, it's been quite a bit of a debate in the field before. So, you know, the, the fact that we're seeing this in during actual infection is really uh, quite interesting um, and informative um, as we compare what we see to what goes on in the tissue culture dish. And then finally, I'll finish with uh, this example. You know, why are these things here? Why are you putting virus into an enclosed compartment? And what does that do for you um, if you're a virus when you want to get out and infect new things? And so what we've um, actually found were some examples which uh, show as though these compartments can actually fuse with these invaginations in white here that can go out and allow the virus to diffuse away um, and you know, go infect another cell potentially. And so if we look at this um, in 3D, what you can see here is that um, there's the HIV virion right there. And so here you can see a compartment that goes away completely. And then you can see the, the periphery of the compartment and then it fuses it's, uh, with the uh, plasma membrane and then, and then um, sorry, the plasma membrane invagination. And so this is, you know, potentially a mechanism by which these uh, viruses and compartments can actually, um, you know, dump their compartments, uh, dump their contents, and then let them go out and potentially infect a new cell as a uh, um, free virus. And so, and then these, you know, one other thing, thing you know, that's uh, really interesting and um, but speculative is that you know, maybe these macrophages can really, they're, they're in the process of going somewhere else. You know, if you take one of these, macrophages that's filled with you know thousands of viruses and you let it go out and you know go infect things in some other tissue you know you can really see a pretty good vehicle for um dissemination of virus to you know diverse tissues throughout the body um so i'll summarize with that uh and that you know that we were able to do this um uh, both uh on bone marrow and look at um both white sheet microscopy and um, electron tomography of HIV dissemination in bone marrow and really find some uh, unique mechanisms by which uh, viruses can uh, infect and disseminate throughout the body. And so I'm going to finish up real quick with um, 
you know, what we're really interested in, and this is, you know, implementation of 3D IF imaging of ad additional tissues. So, for example, you know, we, we can image entire lymph nodes here and see, you know, is there a polarity of virus up here in green um, and not in other locations throughout the tissue. We've also imaged reproductive tract. Um, and then in non-human primate studies, you know, we can look at here uh, at T cells in the spleen and we can actually see where um, regions of virus are in comparison to other uh, T cells that are potentially target cells. So, and really begin to look at this distribution and thinking about quantifying this in, you know, models that are considered, um, you know, overall better models. Uh, and so that's um, where we're at with that. But then, you know, we can also do this with non-human primate samples uh, and human patient samples. So here's an example of a completely see-through uh, region of non-human primate brain. So we can do things like this. We can also take formal and fixed paraffin embedded uh, samples um, or potentially fresh fixed tissues. And then this is actually an image uh, from human brain um, that I received um, uh, from UCSD. So this is, you know, um, we're starting to be able to look at these, you know, really relevant samples and start to, you know, translate what's going on in the other models um, to human patients. and then. Finally, this example, you know, we can conduct immunostaining and 3D imaging, and these are showing T cell, potential uh, HIV target cells uh, along the villi of an intestinal sample. Um, so this is showing us that we can do this in all types of tissues. Um, and so there's some of our um, preliminary data. Um, and so what we've found is uh, some of these uh, patients from the last GIF cohort, we've uh, Received brain, liver, ileum, duodenum, spleen, jejunum, and these samples were all well preserved and uh, post autopsy, and they cleared very well. They're transparent. We've also conducted in, uh, immunostaining of these samples, and some preliminary results show that we can be indeed in magenta here uh, detect T cells. Um, we can also make out macrophages in specific locations. Um, and this is from gut associated lymphoid tissue. And then we can also, if we look here um, in red, we can see uh, macrophages. You can see these sort of large uh, uh, convoluted uh, nuclear morphologies of these macrophages. There's some more here. And we've actually been able to see uh, T cells and, um, you know, and, and at least in a few examples, some that are um, co localizing with uh, HIV. Proteins, and so this is giving you know some preliminary results showing that we can indeed in detect HIV-infected cells from human patients um, through the uh, from the last get cohort. And then finally, this is um, an example. I'll have to play through this again and, and walk you through this, but this is an example that looks a lot like a um, a T cell incision. So I'll, I'll go back real quick and play this, so you can see right here, and you see this little tendril going here. And then all these nuclei that are encased um, by this uh, CD3 positive T cell staining. So if we turn this into a, um, a, a Z projection of this, what we can see is that um, here is P24 positive uh, signal that's localizing with the T cell. And then it makes this link here. And there's this long connection to the main body of the cell, which is also showing some localization with HIV. Uh, P24 proteins. And so previously, this is only, you know, this is sort of the level of resolution and um, that's been shown uh, for potential. Um, and so these would be classic immunohistochemistry chemistry samples. This is um, the, the esoteric studies from the, I shouldn't say esoteric, they're, they're really cool, but they're uh, from a, um, you know, patients that are very far along during their um, you know, the late stage AIDS. And so, you know, things are a little bit different at that stage. And, you know, with, you know I, I think the sort of resolution of a single slice and also, you know, that they can't make out in 3D, trying to figure out if the, the nuclei are actually completely encapsulated or not, or are they just separate cells that are all sort of uh, stuck together. And so, but this is, you know, this, this image up on the upper right is actually pretty reminiscent of what people see in humanized mice. And so I'll play that again real quick. Um, let's see if it'll play. Okay, I won't play, but um, anyway, yeah. 
this, if you see this sort of polarization and this connection, um, and then this main body here, there's something that's really pretty similar to what's been shown um, from live uh, cell imaging in humanized mice that are HIV infected. So this is something that we really want to pursue because there's a, you know, the, the sort of formation of T cells in fish, you know, is something that's not really established and whether and how important it is for HIV infection um, in people. And then I think this is my last slide or two, but I just want to show everyone that, you know, it, this is uh, an image of an intestinal crypt from uh, a human HIV infected humanized mouse. This is an image of a um, of similar region um, from a human patient. And so what we have is, you know, pretty good tissue ultrastructure. Um, the, the samples are well preserved. We can start to conduct the same um, imaging modalities that I showed previously. And this is another example where on the left is a humanized mouse. This would be um, a vascularized region of uh, lamina propria from a bilis uh, in the intestine. You can see this sort of central um, region that's similar. And so we, we had pretty good cellular preservation. There's not a lot of extraction of the samples in the human patient, for example. And then if we look to the next one, um, we can also do this in spleen. And, you know, there are same thing. The levels of pre um, preservation were quite good, um, high quality. And we really think that, you know, this is going to allow us to generate high enough resolution images that we can conduct the same types of studies and visualize individual virions and individual infected cells within tissues in 3D at ultra-structural resolution um, from human patient samples. So I'll sort of, you know, finish up with this. You know, my vision is to build a spatial map of the pathology and the structural details that occur during HIV transmission within a bunch of tissues uh, throughout the body at different times after infection or after um, you know, um, latent reservoir mobilization after um, you know, uh, individuals go off of art, uh, things like that. So there's a, there's a whole host of questions we can ask. Um, you know, in which tissues, which cells are infected? You know, what about the latent virus reservoir? Can we query this? Um, you know, are there anatomical sanctuaries? You know, all this is I think you know very much unknown right now. Um, in human patients. And so I think we're really well positioned to address and interrogate some of these questions uh, in the near future. And so with that, I'll just uh, thank uh, the people in my lab um, and specifically uh, Anna Zhang as a graduate student that, that's doing a lot of the uh, human patient imaging. Um, my postdoctoral advisor, Pamela Bjorkman, and her EM scientist in her lab, Mark Ledinsky, for all their help. Um, Dong Sung An and Nai Kamaikoen at UCLA for their um, generation of HIV infected humanized mice. And then we've got our collaborators here at UCSD, Sarah Vianella and Davy Smith, who are uh, involved in the last GIF cohort. And then there's, um, you know, we've got a couple other really cool studies um, coming out soon looking at uh, virus um, recrudescence after stopping antiretroviral therapy in humanized mice. Um, and, you know, we also have some collaborators uh, looking at non-human primate samples. And this is the funding, and uh, if anyone's interested, I am looking for postdocs and grad students. So, if, you know, if you know someone or you want to come join my lab, please come talk to me. Um, and then finally, thanks for your time. I'd definitely be very happy to uh, uh, answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much. Still, total number didn't add up to the total number of macrophages. So, you know, still really showed us that macrophages are indeed, you know, they, they can be co localizing with um, HIV proteins and 
I think we've shown by OPM they can be producing virus. And so I think they're, you know, they're definitely a, a, a true target um, and, and also, you know, involved in a, in a pretty, you know, impressive level. And so you're not, you're not distinguishing between cells that are productively infected versus a cell that might have virus stuck to them or... Yes, no, that's a, that's a really good question um, or a, a really good point. And so, yes, we are. That's why I sort of, I, I'm, I'm always careful with my wording and what I'm saying infected versus now if we see by electron tomography that a cell is producing virus we can say that's an infected cell although i even often don't say that i say a virus producing cell yeah. <laughs> because by certain people's <laughs> definitions you know unless you can detect the integration it's not an infected cell um but anyway so that's um those are really good points and so at the light microscopy level currently we can't differentiate between say a dendritic cell that you know has a bunch of Virus is attached to it versus. So, yeah, that is definitely limited. And then in uh, some of your CNS stuff, yeah. can you say microglia versus T cells? So, we right now, so what we do is we, we have that up and running. So, we can, um, you know, it's not ready for the public to see it, but we, we have assays up and running. We can definitely detect microglia. We can definitely detect astrocytes. Um, we can definitely detect. Um, other potential immune cells. So I think, you know, so we have sort of all the markers ready to go, and we just really haven't um, done those experiments completely yet. So that's something we're really interested in because that's another uncharted territory thing, and, you know, who's infected and who's producing virus. And, yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you have a technical issue. I noticed in, in a lot of cases you use a CBT antibody yep. because. It obviously works better. It does work really well. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my undergrads do to, you know, see if they can, you know, pipe that Right. So, um, do you have any idea how you would use that antibody to actually detect an epitope retrieval system to use the CD4 and CD8? No, we haven't had to. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of, um, you know, we just, we have to go through, a, you know, we have to go through a fair number of antibodies so we find one. Yeah, and that's how we've been going. Like we don't do any epitope retrieval. Um, and we also, you know, I don't know if this helps or not, but we, we all of these tissues were fixed in a um, you know, higher percentage of paraphernaldehyde because we actually, um, you know, we wanted to fix everything identically for both PM and like mm -hmm. microscopy. And so I don't know if that's sort of helping out some of the epitopes and the, but yeah, we just, we find antibodies that work and then that's what we go with. And we, we just like, you know, we, we pay, um, um, you know, the various companies, you know, and try out five of their antibodies, and finally one works, and then we go. Yeah. As a last gift, specimens often patients who stop their antivirals and they rebound. Right now, they're all they've all been on their antiretrovirals. So, what say about like within the, a couple of days? I think is that actually last week five, which was the one that we should the CDC mm -hmm. Here is our patient that is a paid and dying, and I saw him take the max the day that he died. So, he was completely suppressed. Right. Mm -hmm. so, which makes it even more exciting that you can see. Yeah, it. yeah, and then, but I will say with those examples, uh, you know, that so far we haven't found a lot of examples, and so this kind of fits too. If we saw like infected cells and virus everywhere, I mean, you know, we might say what's going on here. But yeah, it's they're rare, but they're there. I guess is my, you know, my take home from that. <laughs> That's what I keep asking myself. Is right now we have a uh, you know an end of about three years, so it's a, it's a, you know I think if we I think if we cover enough volume, you know I don't know maybe like I think if we get like you know twenty to fifty or something like that, it's like a talking dog, right? If you have a talking dog, you have a talking dog. <laughs> Yes, yeah, that is a very yes, good point. Good point. Yes. But, yeah, this is this is this is yeah, this is still in the stage where it's sort of like uh, you know, way um, you know, twenty years ago you could publish a crystal structure with only a crystal structure and you know 
up until recently, you could publish a cryo EM structure with just a cryo EM structure, no biology. So, you know, maybe we could, uh, you know, get that out. <laughs> if it's really convincing, I think, yeah. How deep can you go with your immunofluorescent <coughs> Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. So, I mean, we can go, um, you know, we can go all the way through a sample. It does, the, the limitation being it takes time. So, you know, we're basically relying on diffusion. Um, and so, but you can actually, you know, we haven't done these experiments, but, you know, the people that have, you can actually monitor the rate of diffusion through a sample. So what I didn't tell you in the uh, bone marrow samples is that we actually cheated a little bit where we made a, a few tiny little holes in the sample so that diffusion could happen more rapidly. Um, so there's, there's some tricks like that you can do. Because um, the bone marrow is not a very dense tissue, whereas, uh, but the bone is. Um, uh, whereas something like a lymph node, and um, something that has a lot of salt and a lot of collagen, is going to take a bit longer. But time is really the only thing that's, you know, you just have to do much longer incubation. So practically speaking, what we normally do is we just prep a lot of samples at once. Um, cause it might take, you know, two weeks to actually stain everything. Um, and, you know, I have some, there's some things we can do, say, um, using some of these, uh, darkens and things like that that are just much, um, or like these camelid antibodies or, you know, some of these, um, you know, immune targets that are actually much smaller than an antibody. So that's some, one way you could potentially get around that, but, um, we just used time so far as our, you know, to get in there. Yeah. So about your humanized mouse model, um, I, I, was, I was interested to see um, the infected um, mac the macrophages in the bone marrow because I know there's a lot of controversy as to whether macrophages can populate yep. in, in humanized mouse. Yeah, but I will say that, um, so uh, Victor Garcia's group has made a macrophage-only mouse model, and that, like, it's actually crazy, the kinetics of HIV uh, systemic spread are literally identical in that animal as the, um, the T cell only. Yeah, you know, so they have the, the mom macrophage only and the Tom T cell only models. And they're literally identical, which is that, that kind of shocked me a bit. Um, so that's right. And we use, we use the, for this study in the bone marrow, we use BLT, the BLT humanized mouse model, which is considered the most human like model. And, um, so, you know, that, and that's sort of the, more or less the basis for this part of this macrophage only model. So I think that's one of those areas where, you know, we're becoming pretty confident that, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question because there, there has been and there still is a good controversy in that uh, field and whether people would accept it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.